Today on the podcast, we're diving into the mind of Blair King. If I enjoy playing rugby and I'm having fun with my mates, I, I play well, the results come, we win. <laughs> Blair Kinghorn is a Scottish rugby player that plays professionally as fullback for, you guessed it, Scotland. Blair was the first ever Scottish player to score a hat trick in the Six Nations in 2019. And he's also the youngest ever player to reach 100 games for Edinburgh. Today, we're going to be getting a deeper understanding of what it takes to be a professional rugby player. My name is Harrison Brown, and this is the Into the Mind podcast. If you're listening, I hope this helps. I heard that you DJ'd. Me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I dabbled in it a little bit. You dabbled? Tell me about it. Is it, is it your girlfriend? She DJ? Yeah, so my missus is um, is a DJ and a nutritionist. Uh, when I first got together with her, I was very, I was kind of interested in DJing. I thought it looked pretty cool. So yeah. I was like, I'll Retro. give it, I was like, I'll give it a bash. Why not? So she had decks at her house. And then I was like, I'm going to get a better decks in my house. <laughs> I'm going to buy more expensive ones. I'm going to get better ones. <laughs> Thinking if you get more expensive decks, you'll be better. But that's not how it works. Same with cameras. I was yeah. like, I'll buy a good camera and I'll be great. It's like my golf game is like, it's going terribly at the moment. It's like, I will buy new clubs and I will be better. <laughs> and uh, so your girlfriend's a nutritionist. In terms of the diet of Scottish rugby players, mm. What does that consist of? Talk me through a day. You had two bacon rolls this morning, but talk me no, through a normal day. No, don't tell her about that. <laughs> Didn't have that, darling. It's fine. Um, I, Dina's really good. So whenever I'm at home, um, she's, we order in all our meat, uh, like organically and grass fed. We get all our vegetables delivered. Mm. So she's big into good quality over loads of food. Yeah, if that makes sense. So everything that we kind of eat at home is really good quality, um, organic stuff. And she's a great cook as well. So I've actually got really lucky. Mm, so I would say in our you. household, it's about 95% her cooking, 5% <laughs> me cooking. I'm a good cook. It just takes me ages to make meals. Do you get stressed out in the kitchen? I don't get stressed out. It just takes me so long. So she yeah. can be doing three or four jobs at once. I know it's cliche to say, but men can multitask. But in the kitchen, I can't multitask. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I'm making like a half an hour, if it if it says it'll take half an hour to make this meal, it's an hour and 15 for me. <laughs> um, and do you have, so uh, does the Scotland team, when you're training, uh, when you're in camps, do they go, this is your set diet, you're only allowed X? Uh, so every, not necessarily X or Y, but they put out, so when we're, we stay in the hotel, yeah. all our meals are done for us. We come down in the morning, it's a buffet, sort of yeah. breakfast, lunch. Oh, so someone cooks for you? Yeah, we've got a chef at, in camp. It's great. You're living up. Oh, uh, when we stay in, honestly, staying in the team hotel is great. Yeah. Um, great rooms. You're with all the lads. You can have crack in the team room, and then you don't need to think about what you're going to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because it's made for you. It's really, it's a really lazy way of living, but it's great. So we're getting all the nutrition that we need mm. to fuel us, like for our training or games. So you come down in the morning, and we usually have a chef who's got a little omelet station. If not, there's like a buffet. Yeah. Same yeah. with lunch, and then same with dinner. Yeah, I'm and guessing you're not nice. allowed like pancakes. It's more like omelets and. Uh, well, to be fair, we burn so many calories when we're running around. Yeah. Um, that is not. It's not strict? too strict, but whatever the, I feel like, whatever they put out in the buffet, the yeah. nutritionist is okay. It so. Yeah. <laughs> so as long as I'm they don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but then sometimes I'll say to my missus, "Like, oh, we're having this, this, and this." She's like, "Hmm, what?" <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> it's the annoying thing about living with someone who know so much about health yeah and food and diets and stuff like that that they almost know too much so i come mm. home with like diluting juice or yeah. like pre-made bagels and she's like no no bad <laughs> red you. flag bad for your gut so your gut's your second brain i learned so much stuff at home but sometimes <laughs> it is annoying but i know she's just looking out for the best of me absolutely and uh i heard when you were 15 or 16 you had a choice between football and rugby <laughs> is that true uh well i had a choice yeah it was i i um i played for hearts academy uh i think it was under 13 or under 14 and that always was played on a sunday mm. and my rugby at school was played on a saturday um and then when you move to under 15 is when they both um both moved to a saturday so i had a decision to make whether i'm like pie rugby off 
yeah. and give the football a crack at hearts or if i pie a football off and give rugby a crack yeah and i, pro- I was probably a better rugby player than i was a football player yeah. um is that is that the switch so you just thought i'm better at this so i also enjoyed rugby much more um yeah. i was playing with all my school friends yeah um it was more casual even i was very surprised at even the age of like 14 15 how competitive like professional academies are in football mm. it's very cutthroat like you have a bad game you're out the door really well maybe not as cutthroat as that but <laughs> that's brutal <laughs> i feel like it's pretty much as competitive as like proper professional sport is yeah and yeah. i was just so young i was a, it was a bit of a eye opener to me mm. so i wasn't playing like the foot when i played for my club team mm. Tynecastle boys club I just loved playing, so I was playing with my mates. It was like no pressure, I was doing it for the fun. And then it got a little bit too serious for me, I reckon. It, th- there's this funny perception. As soon as a hobby becomes a job, mm. you're demotivated. So as soon as there, there's actually been studies that have been done on this. So people that do, for example, basketball as a hobby, as soon as you bring a payment into it, they yeah. no longer enjoy it half as much. So do you think the fact that the, the, the football got so competitive that it started to get to that stage where you could get paid, that maybe it demotivated you? um i was probably quite far away off from getting paid but i do kind of know what you mean it does take the fun yeah. out of it if it is if it, it was i think it was just a bit too serious for how for yeah. the age that i was um do you think rugby is different in the way that it's maybe more of a there's more of a group there like there, there's more of the kind of the boys being the boys and it's fun yeah it felt more like a team kind of i reckon at that well this is when i was pretty young but yeah. i felt more like i was just playing with my mates everyone wants the best out of everyone whereas yeah felt a bit not toxic at football, but maybe a little bit. Yeah, it's more competitive, maybe. So competitive. The parents yeah. on the touchline screaming. <laughs> it's battering each other. It's mad. But like, I'll tell you, if I, if I knew I'd make, make it a football, yeah. I would have stuck with football. I would have get paid five times my salary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so take me through a training session. What I've noticed amongst the industry, and we spoke about this earlier, is the rugby players seem to be getting more agile and faster, but maybe they aren't as big and chunky as they used to be. Is that a conscious decision within the rugby community in order to, to, to go that way, be a bit more skilled rather than bigger? Um, I think there's still a lot of big, big boys out there. Yeah, 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 <laughs> there's yeah. still a lot of big humans out there. Um, I think in terms, it is definitely getting more skillful. It's harder to break down defences and attack. It's harder to score, etc. Mm. So everyone's having to get better like in the past it would have been forwards were just used for battering for battering people in the backs we'd try and do everything yeah like skill wise whereas now everyone's pretty much equal yeah and you still got people who can batter people yeah and Um, the the forwards are fast and the forwards big fast skillful so it's kind of i would say rugby's evolving certainly if you looked at a game 20 years ago compared to a game now Mm. it it, is night and day just with the evolution of it and i think it would be interesting to if you had a team now played a team in their prime and 20 20 years ago yeah yeah, what would happen injuries a lot (laughs) a lot of injuries a lot of people battering each other and you so obviously there's there's been that change of um of going maybe a little bit more in the skilled side a little bit more in the fast side is that that's reflective in the training so take me through a training day in the in the scotland team with scotland stuff um usually the backs get good so we're always split up backs and forwards so usually the backs get quite good we get a bit more of a lion uh than the forwards so have it easy yeah so if we're in the hotel the forwards are up in the gym at 8 30 so they've had their breakfast by then in the gym at gym at 8 30 mm. backs are usually up gym at 9 30 so we get an extra hour to have a bit of coffee a bit of crack um an omelet <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the stuff we do in the gym now um with our snc guy chris leck is very based on translating it to the pitch so mm. in the past it's probably just like oh how much can you bench how much can you squat and that's pretty much it whereas now we still do like the main the main key lifts but a lot of we're doing a lot more extra stuff on the side power stuff that'll translate to performance on the pitch so it's trying to tie everything in to being better when you're playing uh, yeah so you're, you're not doing weights just to see how like heavy you can lift yeah you're doing them logically for a reason that's yeah reflective on the pitch yeah exactly and okay. if you do it then you get stronger naturally but yeah it's not just lifting for the sake of lifting everything's got a purpose yeah um the forwards shift up a lot of tin 
Yeah, like a lot. <laughs> I, I, I can imagine looking at the look of them. The intensity of the forwards gym session compares to the backs gym session is quite funny. We get the backs are getting better now, but it's yeah. always a little bit more relaxed. Forwards yeah. are very testosterone based. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. outmuscle you. Whereas the backs are more like, oh, we're Chill chilling. Um, and uh, and you so, in terms of your position, as fullback. Did you fall into that position or was it an active choice where you thought this is the one that I enjoy? Do you know what I mean? Uh, I think yeah, whatever position you get put in always falls down on your first rugby coach. Right, okay. <laughs> so when I was at school, um, I was in primary five maybe and then it was our physics teacher at the time was the rugby coach and he was right. like, you'll play fly half. And I was like, sounds good to me. I'm away from the <laughs> fours. And then just throughout my whole school career, I played that uh, fly half. Yeah. And then I went to under 20s and I got moved to 15. And then I've kind of not looked back since, apart from t uh, two years ago where I then moved back to 10 mm. for Edinburgh and then um, with Scotland as well. Yeah. But I'm happy that my physics teacher made me a back. Yeah. And Instead a of a forward. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so you, so you think basically your teacher, when you're younger, has total jurisdiction <laughs> I think, it has a, I think it has a big influence for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I just, I, I didn't know how, obviously you see Darcy Graham as the winger mm. or, uh, and use the fullback or whatever it is. I, it's interesting that you don't consciously choose that position almost. It's almost like it's kind of, the, the pathway is already molded for you a little bit. I think for certain people, yes. Like Darcy is, I think Darcy could have chosen his position because he's small, he's fast, he's nippy. Yeah. Whereas me, I was like a tall kid at school. Mm. Wasn't that fast when I was younger. I could have easily been put in the second row. You weren't fast when you were younger? Not really. Like I was fast, but I went through a growth spurt and yeah. I got slow. And yeah. then I got fast again. Because uh, you're, you're absolutely, what, you're fast. I was pretty fast uh, when I was about 13, to be fair. Maybe just before then I wasn't that fast. Because you, you were, at the moment, I would say... You're, you're, you're within competition of the wingers at the moment in terms of the fastest player on the Scotland team. Mm. I beat Dewey in the GPS the Did other you? day, but he gets so angry about it. Dewey's definitely <laughs> faster than me. <laughs> but yeah, I reckon, I, I do reckon that if I if he had put me in the second row, my physics teacher, then maybe I've grown up being second row. <laughs> do you think? No, I don't know. I'm a bit soft, <laughs> so probably not. Um, so do you think the change... Everyone's getting that little bit, not slimmer, but a little bit faster, a little bit more agile. Do you think that change is potentially due to stricter rule enforcement? Um, no, I don't think so. I think you, the the kind of the rules that are coming in is mainly with like shoulder to head sort of thing, high tackles, etc. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's that. I think people are looking more athletic now. I would say that rugby players nowadays are more powerful than they were back in the day. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though rugby back in the day looks far more brutal because there was the law, yeah. the laws weren't enforced. Like yeah, you can <laughs> kick people, yeah, you can kick people, stand on people, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, I think players are now having to make a more of a conscious decision to kind of. You can get away with some tackles in the past, maybe that nowadays, like yeah. a little glancing shoulder to the head, even if it's not like intentional you can get red carded very easily but i think that's a good thing because yeah so i was reading the other day about footballers and um, footballers are 50 percent more likely to get alzheimer's when they're older due to headers headering the ball yeah is that something that you you, you kind of worry about uh i think there's there's been quite a lot of chat in the change room about like your well-being like your mm. your brain's well-being personally i'm pretty far away from all like hitting my head every session like i know a lot of the forwards who have having to do scrums, malls, pick and go sort of things, it probably yeah. maybe if it's on their mind a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but personally, I like I I feel I feel like the steps that are kind of coming into the game with head injury assessments and whatnot, they're being very strict on concussions now. So you can't really come back from a concussion within two weeks nowadays. That's good. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I per personally, it doesn't. I I'm not too worried about it. Yeah, because um, I'm out of the rough and tumble, but <laughs> you're I know far away. I'm far away from it. I know some people are, and it it ties in as well to like if you're healthy, yeah, off the pitch, you're taking the right supplements, you're eating well, then you're gonna giving your body the best chance to combat the sport that we play. That's a great point. Do you think it's more risky to be a rugby player in terms of injury, or it is to be? you know, obese, playing video games all day, it's probably more dangerous doing the latter. Oh, for sure. So yeah. depending on how you look at it, you know, there's obviously tons of risks with rugby. Yeah. 
but actually because you're physical and because you're playing a sport you're probably more healthy than 90 percent of the population yeah we live a we, we our main risk comes from injuries on the pitch like you can break your leg you can break your neck mm. whatever and then the long-term things if people do have brain traumas etc but we live a healthy lifestyle we exercise mm. five six times a week yeah. we're in the gym we eat well um and yeah it's just it's it's much better than, for you than being sedentary and yeah. overweight there's a real kind of i feel like there's a culture coming in now where it's so okay, people think it's okay to be overweight mm. um because it's if you if you call someone fat it's fat shaming whereas yeah. i i kind of look at it more of like the health ways like you're making yourself unhealthy yeah yeah think about your insides and sort of thing and then my missus has probably opened my eyes to that a bit more because yeah we do try and make a conscious effort to eat a bit better because she she tells you all the details about what happens yeah. if you eat all these terrible foods. But, but that, that'll be great because it's part of it, I think, is education. And a lot of people genuinely aren't educated to the food that they're eating. Mm -hmm. And they actually think, and my ex-girlfriend was a dietitian. She was telling me that um, some of the peoples that she, she used to deal with, they genuinely believed that eating three McDonald's a day was okay mm. because it's cheap. Yeah. And, and it goes back to that education process of like if, the, if if you don't tell someone that something's bad yeah how are they gonna know yeah exactly and i think that like so so i think that being a rugby player having that kind of commitment and sport and drive is probably although there's risks involved it's probably a lot more healthy than the latter of yeah. like not doing that definitely going on to injuries did you have an injury on in your shin shin was it your shin or below your when I was doing my research, I was I was yeah. I was inspecting you. Nice. And I was thinking, somewhere here. <laughs> uh, I've actually been pretty lucky with injuries. Yeah. Um, touch wood. I the only serious injury I had, I did my syndesmosis, which is a ligament in your ankle, which makes your foot go up and down. Oh, so it's thing. like the hinge joint. Yeah, if it, effectively. Um, and I injured that in the Six Nations 2019, so it was mm. a while ago. That's when you scored your hat trick, isn't it? Yeah, 2019 is when uh, I scored my hat trick. Was it 2019? It was 2019. Yeah, mm. I did it against Wales. Uh, so I needed surgery from that. I had like a, a little bone fracture as well, as well as some bone bruising. So it took a little bit longer to come back from. Usually it's yeah. a, an eight-week injury, but it kind of took me 12 12 to 13 weeks how is the recovery process was it painful being stuck inside um it was and it wasn't like it was it was tough after the surgery because you can't do anything yeah so you're just sitting there in bed yeah like after surgery like oh i'm not allowed to sweat for a week because <laughs> you've got an open yeah. wound but then after that i kind of enjoyed the process of getting in the gym where i've because I'm quite a lean guy, it was the first time I really had opportunity to put a lot of size on in the gym. Yeah. Um, because you weren't allowed to run. Because you, you you can't burn you can't burn off by yeah. running. Uh, and I probably did in an unhealthy way. This was before I was with my girlfriend. Um, I would eat some of the stuff I would eat because I was trying to put on weight, and I'm I usually sit around 101 kilos. But then mm -hmm. when I was injured, I got up to 110. So I put what, on nine like kilos? nine. I put on like nine kilos. Oh my god! <laughs> but not that healthily. I was having two dinners every night. I'd have like two steaks, rice, asparagus, and then a large pizza as well, and then a mass gainer shake and four bits of toast. And it's just like bad, isn't it? You had that every night. I'd have that most nights, <laughs> and I put on nine kilos. To oh be my fair. god! And then I went to Ibiza on holiday and I lost six kilos <laughs> just because you're out in the sun dancing the whole time. Drinking. Sweating. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, insane. But that was leading up to actually the last World Cup. Mm. so i didn't really have any time off because i was injured I and mean, it rolled straight into pre-season with uh, world cup stuff mm. and i'd put on nine kilos i'd only done two running sessions because i'd just come back from my ankle and then yeah. we did our fitness testing and i couldn't run the length of myself and then i was like right okay i need to lose some weight yeah. <laughs> this is a problem though <laughs> yeah. and then it came off me really quickly like i lost a couple of kilos when we were just doing normal training then i went to ibiza mm. in our holiday in pre-season lost a few more kilos just because when you're on holiday you just drink and yeah you're in the sun sweating um and then i came back from that holiday about 105 kilos and then i ran a pb in my fitness test so good it all worked out quite so the nicely. Boost helped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> going to ibiza and right so my ankle was really stiff i was really struggling to get my range back into my ankle yeah um and then I went on. I went to Ibiza. You're dancing all day, and then I came back and I got all my range back because I'd just been on my feet all the time dancing. And you probably couldn't feel it because you were trying. Exactly. Anyway. <laughs> so it loosened off my ankle. So it was for the best. <laughs> and what? What do you think? I, I remember when I was playing rugby when I was in school. 
there was a guy called Nick and uh, I was on the wing so I was I was quite fast and Nick gets tackled it's quite a low tackle and all, all you hear is like a but it's more like a snap and then a crunch yeah. Nick lifts up his leg his oh, ankle's no. the wrong way round yeah. right I, I can't, and honestly I, I've never I, I'm, it's, it makes me so nervous to this day like thinking about it yeah. what is the worst injury you've ever seen oh uh, it's probably similar to that one mm. um it was uh it was for edinburgh we had a player called cornell dupree mm. great player one of the best players i've played with and he did the same thing he had like a compound fracture in his ankle so his ankle was poking out of his sock the wrong way foot was twisted around oh my God. but he was the hardest man i've ever known he just looked at the physio was like my ankle and that was it he didn't scream there was no scream no, no he's mental what? Yeah, he's mad. His yeah. ankle's the wrong way round. Oh yeah, I'd have a total panic. <laughs> yeah. Boys came over and were like looking at him like, oh, and he was just like, Tracy, my ankle. Oh my god. Yeah, he's a he's a tough fucker, like really tough. That is horrendous. Uh, um, but there's, I've actually been quite lucky. I don't think I've seen uh, like too horrific injury, like too many horrific injuries. Ones that are minging to look at is when people. Uh, get really really bad gashes from studs yeah. and you look down and it's just like Blood. split open you're like okay yeah you're like, Whoa. <laughs> i had one of them on my knee i tackled someone from behind landed on a stud and i was like oh i've landed on my knee weirdly i looked yeah. down and i just like blood everywhere no blood because it, it was like deep enough where there's nothing it was just like gaping open like you see all your white stuff and like your fat and i was like okay oh my god i'm coming off now <laughs> <laughs> that's me done yeah the I, I was looking at uh, the, the stats between rugby players and football players in terms of pay. Mm. And I think, in my opinion, there's this thing where it comes from risk versus uh, kind of reward. Now, pay, players, rugby players, it's a lot more physical of a game with a lot more injuries, um, statistically. Yeah. Do you think it's fair that football players get paid the amount that they do comparatively to rugby players? I'd say so, yeah. It's the most popular game in the world. Mm. Like anywhere you go, people know who football players are. It's ma like if you look it's just enormous, isn't it? Yes, yeah, football is worldwide. Yeah. Worldwide, wherever yeah. you go, everyone loves football. They bring in so much money, like yeah. big games down in the Premier League or even at like Ibrox or Selic Park, it's massive. It's ma it's like international level people coming to a game every week, week in, week out. Yeah. So yeah, they they bring in so much money. Um, I was speaking to this the other day about uh, with someone that it's it's much more personalised football. So obviously rugby is one to twenty three. You yeah. can't change your number. Whereas football, you can have whatever number you want. Or like yeah. basketball, have whatever number you want. So just say I'm number eight. That's my number, and people will walk can go by Kinghorn eight. It just brings in much yeah. more money if people if people like you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> if they hate you, it doesn't work. If they hate you, no. And like footballers are celebrities almost. Yeah. Like they're so massive everywhere. So yeah, no, I'd, they do get paid a ridiculous amount of money in certain places. Yeah. Um, but I, th I suppose it's based on views. It's based on what money they bring in, and I think yeah. it's fair enough to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with them being sort of just jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> with them being kind of celebrities. They've obviously got there's this, there's this thing when we you know when, when nobody's watching you right it's a bit like today like Drew's behind the camera but but nobody's you're not being watched by tons of people and mm. um, I know that you were talking about Netflix a bit earlier yeah. we'll get onto that but uh, it increases the pressure mm -hmm. it's a bit like when you put a camera on someone's face and it increases the pressure and I think social media in a sense has done that to people because let's say you mess up during the game you're now open to so much criticism from across the board how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, yeah i i feel like um i feel like it can be tough sometimes i for for certain people i tend to not get too bothered by it mm. um i was i always think to myself like you're getting this little this little bit of abuse think about like we're talking about footballers they mm. get like tons of abuse all the time yeah it's brutal uh but we're in the public eye it's it's part and parcel like the abuse that we get is it's not that bad it's part and parcel of being in the public eye obviously some footballers get horrific races racist abuse which is yeah. completely not okay yeah um but for me it's all about like oh you're shit yeah like oh you're playing 10 again catastrophe etc yeah. so it's like those sort of things don't really bother me too too it much it doesn't get to no, you no i don't think so but maybe when i was younger it got to me a little bit but mm. 
I deleted my my or Twitter app on my phone just because that uh, helps. I, I don't see a point in looking at it to be honest. Yeah. Um, some of the some of the comments are hilarious though. Yeah, it's like your shit. Why do you not do this? And then you look who's you look who's messy. You know, it's just it's like we're talking about some fat person. I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> rugby expert. Yeah. So exactly. I, like, I actually do find it a bit funny. In, yeah. But I know for certain players that it can be it can be like a burden on their shoulders. They get affected by it quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but for me, I kind of like water off a duck's back, to be honest. Yeah, you don't really, I you don't, do, really don't pay too much attention to it. No, I don't pay attention to it because it doesn't really, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And do you, do you think that, have you ever had an encounter with a, a, a fan, so to speak, that's been negative? Have you ever had someone being what, like, in person? So, yeah, or is it always online? It's always online, never in person. That's the thing. Never. Some people are just like that's how some people operate it's sad yeah. Yeah. but then it's like you say they see you in person nothing yeah I, I, yeah because because it's almost like a keyboard warrior isn't yeah, it? it is they want to feel good about themselves D- does that kind of social pressure so to speak increased anxiety when going on to the because you've got you've got like thousands of people watching you yeah. from around the world does that increase the pressure because you know that it's personal now uh no i don't think so i think you, when you go out I th- onto the pitch you're so focused on the job in hand that it's kind of not really you blur it out you kind of do blur it out it's funny like before so just say before a Scotland game I'll be very nervous I'll be yeah. sitting there like oh no I'm about to play in front of 67,000 people yeah I hope I do well <laughs> um, and then when you're in the game you're like in the zone kind of thing it's like flow state yeah kind of well yeah. when you do get in flow state it's nice you play well though sometimes you're just kind of dotting about the place trying to do your best yeah. um but yeah, you kind of block out the crowd until you, like, just say someone on your team scores a try or you win and yeah. you hear the crowd going nuts. That's when it kind of really sits in like, oh, yeah, this is... Lots of people watching This me. is really good, yeah. Whereas, like, in the middle of a game with not not much happening, you're just doing your thing, you don't really notice people. Yeah. It's weird to say that, but it's true. And has <clears throat> anxiety been something that you've dealt with going onto the pitch? Uh, no, I don't think so. Like, everyone gets nervous. Like, I get nervous just like the next person. Um... It's just about flipping your mindset. Like nerves are good, yeah. not too many nerves. Obviously, you, or you use go them. into your shell. Yeah, I, I, I've I've tried to use them uh, as like an excite exciting way. Like I've probably had a mindset shift, maybe in the last year or two. About uh, I know what I'm capable of. I'm gonna go out there and try and do my thing. Whereas in the past, maybe it was like, oh, I'm nervous. Mm. I'm gonna go into my shell mm. and kind of like not hide, but almost. I remember my dad texted me after the, one of the games and I hadn't played well and I looked nervous on, on the ball and he was like, you, you looked like you were hiding a little bit into your shell. And it kind of, I was like, yeah, I, I kind of felt like that at the time. Yeah. So I've kind of made a conscious effort. We've got a, like um, a skill, a mental skills coach now with Scotland called uh, Aaron, Aaron Walsh. Um, and he's been really good in kind of changing your mindset going into games. Like I used to be worried about so just say I was I uh, I wasn't the best goal kicker maybe last season. So I would get really nervous like what if I got to take a goal kick here, mm. and it's like no you got to sh- shift your mindset. It's like this is what I'm really good at. This is what I'm going to put on the pitch. So I know I was like I'm a good runner. I can offload the ball. So that's what I'm excited to do now, mm-hmm. rather than think about what could go wrong. Yeah, and it is challenging, but you, I think it is important for people to work on their mental mental skills and mental strength going into a game because it can be brutal if you make mistakes in an international it costs you points all the time and you're a bit like oh no there's so much pressure on yeah there's uh, international games there's a lot of pressure so it's kind of how do you change your mindset going into games where you're more comfortable because everyone plays their best rugby when they're relaxed like you see when we're winning by a lot of points everyone's like okay we can relax now yeah and then they just play their game whereas if people are uptight they're like oh fuck don't want to do that 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 (laughs) You don't play as well, so I think it's it's a massive part of the game. I think he's helped me a lot, kind of shifting my focus. But mentally. Yeah, because yeah, it's huge. We need to pause this conversation with Blair really quickly to bring to you our brand new sponsors. Chisholm Hunter are the brand new sponsors of the Into the Mind podcast, and it's quite fitting because day to day, I get tons of questions about my jewellery and about my watches, especially on the Chisholm Hunter YouTube channel. All my jewellery and all my watches are from Chisholm Hunter. They're a diamond and luxury watch retailer in the UK with 29 stores and they've been going for about 165 years, which is pretty incredible. As well as that, Chisholm Hunter are actually family run. And to me, that means a hell of a lot within a business. 
All of my watches, all my jewelry are from Chisholm Hunter. So if you want to get your first watch or invest in something for your partner, head to chismhunter.co.uk. That's chismhunter.co.uk. I think it's very prevalent in UFC fighters, this kind of nerves thing, because they might be in training camp for three, three to six months. Mm. And then they, they go out and within five seconds, they get sparked out by Conor McGregor. Out, yeah. yeah. And that must be so demoralized. And you see them going into a state of depression after the mm -hmm. state of, do you ever get so hyped up about a game? And if you lose it, it really affects you mentally? Um, I'd say, I'd say so, yes, that you get, you build up a game, like a big game in your head. Every, you want to play well every game. But if you've got a big game coming up, and you don't play well in it and you lose it is it's sad i get i wouldn't say i get depressed i get grumpy grumpy yeah um, your bird doesn't want to be around you my, oh, my <laughs> missus doesn't like it when i'm grumpy but i snap out of it pretty quickly like it's one or two days and then you've got to snap out of it because rugby your week is back uh, week yeah. after week after week so if you're grumpy from the game saturday to thursday then you've not prepared well enough for the game that's on friday yeah so you kind of got to snap out of snap out of being like grumpy and sad about the way you've performed and you got to get the next week so and do you think that team mentality helps a lot within yeah. that because you might be upset but then you see the boys and they're like oh, come on next yeah, game exactly like you've always got people to bounce off and i think that the thing with the ufc that would be a real struggle is it's just you mm -hmm. and obviously your team but like you build yourself up for a fight and you get knocked out within five seconds you've then got to wait three or four months to then yeah. have another go be able to fight again whereas I play shit or the team plays shit. We got, well, another week. We got one week, five days and we get yeah. another crack at it. Yeah. And having your best pals around you, like, because I spend more time with my teammates than I do with my missus. <laughs> you, you're, they're your best pals on and off the, on and off the pitch. So everyone drags each other through. Um, well, that's a good thing. That's I the think, good thing about a team sport. And that's the thing that is maybe makes me nervous about society nowadays as kids we play sport and we socialize through sport mm -hmm. so so i played rugby and football it wasn't very good at either but i still played <laughs> uh, and we socialize and we learn social skills through that yeah. but what's happening now amongst kids that i can see is they're sitting in their xbox do you want to play rugby yeah we'll, we'll switch it on the xbox yeah. do you think do you see less people coming up in the industry rugby players professional rugby players because of this age of gaming and social media and screens i'd say not yet we still got a lot of good young players in our academy coming through i think it'll be interesting to see in 10 15 years potentially maybe um but that, I, I like when i was younger i was you just ride your bike to your friend's house and you're like you want to go out kick yeah. a ball about it and then that's how it kind of imagine ringing a doorbell instead of calling someone i know <laughs> it's weird eh? it's what you see you go around chat the door how yeah. you doing um but yeah nowadays is everything's a little bit more online um and don't get me wrong i love like technology social media all that all that sort of stuff i'm a big gamer as well mm. um but you gotta get outside and have a bit of crack with your pals run around but I, uh, to be fair i don't i haven't noticed it yet yeah and something that i just wrote down is when I, whenever i see scotland play i'm gonna get shot for this whenever i <laughs> <laughs> whenever i see scotland play I always feel, and, and I, I, I'd love your opinion on this, that their second half is better than their first half. I feel like when they walk out, they're maybe maybe it's the nerves. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're a little bit nervous, but I always feel within 20 minutes, they start getting into that flow state. Yeah. And they're, listen, I'm a Scotland fan. They're unbeatable when they get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just that initial impact. Talk me through that. Do you think there's, a, not anxiety, but you think there's maybe nerves when it comes to the, that game? I, th uh, I think so people are usually feeling the game out in the first 20 minutes and I think we have been guilty of it in the past of maybe feeling out the game too much and like kind of easing our way into it rather than kind of from the from uh, the first whistle getting straight mm. straight into it like that's always that's always your goal is to get straight into a game you're going to win the first 10 look no further than the first 10 minutes that's kind of what a lot of people say mm -hmm. But yeah, sometimes we are guilty of not being quite on it at the start and it costs us points in international rugby. You can be down 14-0. Like when we played the All Blacks, yeah, we ended up 14-0 down after about 12 minutes. And then from there on in, we were really good. Like that's, we, that's literally the game I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it is frustrating because it's... Um, yeah, I don't really... There's uh, there's obviously potentially something, maybe the occasion, like you're saying, like the nerves before a big game like that can maybe get on top of you. Yeah. Um, 
but it's something it's certainly something that we speak about a lot it's like we're going to start strong it's like the first 10 minutes and then the 10 minutes before halftime and the 10 minutes after halftime those are massive moments because start of the game everyone wants to start the game well before halftime a lot of teams switch off you're like right it's nearly halftime we can relax take a breather and then the 10 minutes after halftime people are still warming like back warming, up. yeah warming back up into the game so if you can kind of control those periods of time then you're in a real good stead of winning the game that's and those are the hardest it's when, it's when you're mentally mm. need to focus the the most is like straight after half time yeah <laughs> or yeah. straight after you score a try <laughs> <laughs> and do you think that there's teams i know that there's this scotland england thing and we'll get into that yeah. <laughs> but but do you think that there's certain teams that for example the all blacks you come onto the pitch you're maybe more nervous about is, is there certain teams, specific teams, that Scotland are more nervous about playing? Oh, I think the the bigger teams you play is obviously the more pressure. Um, there's more hyper in the game. So you're like, oh, we're, we're playing the All Blacks. Like, all right, they're big. Yeah. <laughs> like, they're really successful. They're a great team. Um, but I, I find it easier to like play those games because you're almost viewed as it's a it's a weird mentality to have you're viewed as the underdog like there's not as much pressure on you because they people don't expect you to win mm. so i think we play our best rugby when there's less pressure on us to win which i think needs to be our kind of mindset shift now because we're getting better and better mm. we're going into games the favorites now and i think that's maybe something that we need to work on is coming into games as the favorite and then asserting our dominance on teams whereas it's easy to come in as a an underdog and give it your best shot and they're like oh fuck we're close to winning here let's yeah. keep going whereas if you're coming in as number one or you're coming in on top there's more of a pressure for you to perform mm -hmm. so like when we played italy in the six nations just gone it's like we are meant to win we are favorites and it's that's a different pressure and we nearly lost but we didn't we won it was a great <laughs> Listen, day. A win's a win <laughs> a win's a win exactly but it's like right we're favorites here yeah. we need to play well whereas it is yeah so so you think you know yeah I mean? <laughs> we, 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 yeah when, when people think that you're you know they're supporting you but they don't expect you to win there's less pressure on you yeah i think i think not not necessarily like that's what you're thinking straight away but it certainly is in your brain i reckon mm. and i think that's where we need to kind of have a switch yeah i think so i was listening to a podcast is exciting it's very exciting <laughs> <laughs> i was listening to a podcast the other day with uh, joe rogan and i don't know the exact article but he did look it up online so he said that physical activity like rugby like sport like lifting weights whatever it is raises your dopamine by 1.5 x and it's more effective than psychological therapy mm. or drugs and it's interesting whenever i've spoken to rugby players or football players or whoever it is they have a couple of factors playing into their their health they've got healthy diets they've got a team sport which means you've got a ton of people to talk to all the time yeah. and when you're stressed you can release that stress by talking to people uh, and then obviously they've got the physical activity do you think this this all plays in kind of unison to make you mentally stronger yeah i think so i think you've you've got to be resilient to play sport professionally mm -hmm. Because you de the highs are really high, but the lows are are pretty low. Um, and I think, like looking at it just now, we're in preseason for World Cup at the moment, and you've got to be resilient when you're getting flogged by the coaches. Yeah. Get off the line, run there, run back, doing fitness tests, etc. Because you can't give up, um, or you won't get picked. You know what I yeah. mean? So I think it definitely you definitely do become fairly resilient in the in the head, um, mm -hmm. and it's like speaking. We spoke earlier about your mental skills and how you can develop your your mental side of the game to make you more resilient, make you more confident. And I think that plays a big part. But I think going through a lot of tough, grueling moments, especially with your teammates around you, does certainly develop mental resilience. Yeah, because whenever I am feeling crap or feeling down or whatever it is, I'll go for a beer with the boys mm. and they'll be like, shut up, you're fine. Yeah. And I'll be like, you're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, you're right. You know what? I am fine. <laughs> you're, you're right. Uh, or, or I'll go up, like I was telling you, I went up a hike yeah. uh, up a mountain. After that, I felt great. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people maybe nowadays, and it, and it is partially to do with social media and Xboxes and PS4s and gaming and all that kind of stuff. They're stuck indoors. Yeah. And I think that being stuck indoors has psychological 
has a psychological impact. And I think that if you were to play a sport, not professionally, but just yeah, play a sport, yeah, yeah. rugby, football, golf, whatever it is, firstly, you're, you're with other people, you're, you're being physically active, and you're probably going to up your diet in order to get back to the sport. So mm -hmm. getting into a sport, any sport, is really beneficial. Yeah, I think... And if and if you don't want to get into a sport, I think just being active, like getting to the gym, going on a run, like remember my my missus saying like, oh, like I'm feeling a bit meh today, and I'm like, she's like, I'm gonna to go to the gym. I was like, yeah, go to the gym or go on a run. And then she's like, comes back from a run, she's like, I feel great, like just ha half an hour. And she's like, I feel fucking good now. Yeah, like I feel much better. My mind's a bit clearer. So yeah. it's, it, I think it is amazing what exercise can can do to your brain. Yeah, it does make you feel better. It can also make you feel shit when you do too much and you yeah. come back and you're exhausted. <laughs> well, I, I climbed uh, Ben Lomond. I did a sunrise hike, so I'm a photographer and videographer. Yeah. And I got back and was like, you know, I'm just going to, it was this couch here actually. I was just like, <laughs> I'm just going to like, rest my weary head for two seconds. Six hours, gone. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, I've got some questions for, I've actually got about three pages of questions for you, but I've got some more fun questions for you. Okay. And I just want your, I just want your honest answer. Just really quick. All right. I'm trying to get you in trouble here. Okay. Okay. I'll try and not be too honest. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, who's the most intim intimidating player in the sport? In rugby? In rugby at the moment. Most intimidating player in rugby. That you wouldn't want to come up against. See if you saw him on the pitch, you'd be like, bugger. <laughs> Ooh, it's going to be a forward. And it will be, or maybe it won't be a forward. It will be some big South African, probably. I can't, yeah. I can't think of any specific names. Just, South African, just that region. <laughs> anyone big running straight at you is just not fun. Actually, Fijian. 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 Albert Tuasui. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Terrifying. Why is he so terrifying? He's, just He's big, big. And... Have you ever had an encounter with him? Oh yeah, uh, we played when we played Fiji in the autumn. He was terrifying. Fijians are the, the nicest players mm -hmm. off the pitch. Yeah, like they're the loveliest guys on the pitch. They will try and kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Albert, big Alb, terrifying. Do, do you have? It's funny you said that. You said that off the pitch they're the most lovely players. Yeah. Do you feel the same way about English players when they're off the pitch? No. Absolutely not. Not at all. No. Is there still that rivalry? No, know? I don't know. Like to be fair, I don't really know any of them that well. Yeah. Uh, but there is that you do feel that like fucking, I don't fucking like <laughs> these guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. So what is the difference? What ha I, listen, I'm Scottish. There's obviously this rivalry between the Scottish and the English. Yeah. For whatever reason, there there just is. And it's very prevalent in rugby. Mm. What does that feel like? Talk me through. You've got an England game coming. Oh, you up. don't want to lose. So you're, we, you don't want to lose, but you, do you train harder? Like, what's the... Training's definitely maybe got a bit more of a punch to it, that's for sure. Like, really, it will be... It's like when, yeah, when you're training for a big game, just say, like, when you play England, training's definitely got a bit more fucking venom in it. <laughs> <laughs> Not from me, but from some of the... Target best. the injured guy. Yeah, the forwards, get, the forwards get carried away with this sort of thing. Because uh, they do a lot of... Like, in their <coughs> unit session, when they're doing, like, live malls, mm. they can get... Usually they can be some aggressive, maybe not punches thrown, but there's some words said potentially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's a different vibe because you don't want to you you don't want to lose. You don't want to lose. You want to. I mean, we've played really well against England in the last five years. Do you think after the game? So you, they, whoever wins the game wins the game. Are you guys kind of friends after that? Yeah, like a lot of the guys um, went on Lions tours with a lot of the English uh, boys. Some of them they're their teammates. Mm. So I think off the pitch, like. I don't know many of them personally that well, but off the pitch, like we had a beer upstairs in the function suite after. It's all pretty. It's like all fine. It's just on the pitch. It's bragging rights, isn't it? But is it that, I think that's an amazing thing that you can be so aggressive physically and really get your anger out and aggression out. And then as soon as the whistle goes, it's like, let's go grab a beer, mate. Yeah, it's like, well played, well played. Beer, yeah. beer. Yeah. It's good. It is good that. It's kind of... There's that neutral respect. Yeah. Like, every, like everyone knows each other. Um, you've just played 80 minutes, like, trying to batter each other. Yeah. Uh, you, you've got your anger out. You got your... You got, some of the boys got their anger out. <laughs> um, then, yeah, you grab a beer after, because we're all on, we're all in the same sport. And, like, the rivalries are more on the pitch. It's not, like, off-field antics at all. Yeah, I think that's great. And yeah. I think that, going back to UFC as well, throughout the UFC, there's been friends that have to fight each other yeah. and it's so funny watching because before the fight they're best pals when they get in the ring mate 
Yeah, when the bell goes. Just... Yeah, the bell goes, the bell goes. Yeah. And then as soon as it finishes, they've just been choked out and they're like high fiving. Like, uh, yeah, good, good. It's wild. I don't get that sport. It's mental. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's too much. Yeah, it's brutal. I think going back to, I've, I've just thought of this question. Going back to the kind of like injury side of the sport, obviously rugby, you've maybe got up until you're 33, 34. Yeah. Well, well, you get some freak who can play to like 38, but yeah, yeah. probably mid 30s, 33. Mid 30s. Do you think it's hard for rugby players to to move on to the next step in their career? I know we spoke about Jim yeah. Hamilton. Jim Hamilton is, has his own podcast and he's fantastic. I really like him. Big personality. But obviously, he's he's great in front of a camera. So that's mm-hmm. how he can do that. Do you think it's hard for rugby players to move on from rugby after rugby? I think so. I think we're so focused on one thing right now, and that's rugby. It's like training well, eating well, resting, recovering well, playing well, that you kind of forget that, oh, fuck, I'm running out of time yeah. here. And that for me, I went straight from school into rugby so i i didn't go to university or anything i know a lot of the boys are doing university degrees on the side of playing rugby mm-hmm. but it is it's very hard to study and play sport professionally some boys can do it i um i tried it and i'm too lazy i never got into uni so yeah it's fine. <laughs> um so like i feel like now i've been speaking more to people it's like right what we're we gonna do after rugby what we're we gonna do after i mean like hey, it'll come to you it'll be fine and then the years tick by tick by i'm like i've got no idea what i want to do and we'll go from getting paid relatively well to then you finish your career and, and you're starting from scratch scratch again. So yeah. I, w- I was saying this to someone else, like rugby is quite an accelerated lifestyle. Like you, you maybe, because you earn better when you're younger, you maybe buy a house earlier, mm-hmm. you might get engaged earlier, have kids earlier. And then when that's all finished, your rugby's finished, you've got a house with a mortgage, you've got maybe two or three kids, you're engaged or you're married. It's the wrong way around. <laughs> it's almost the wrong way around. So you need to kind of have your head on about what you want to do. I know a few of the boys have got businesses. Um, one of the guys at Edinburgh does a pick and mix. Mm. He's got a pick and mix company. They sell different varieties of sweets and that's doing really well for him. Finsby. Who's Finsby owned by? That's Hoggy. Hoggy's it's got Hog- his, yeah, Hoggy's a part owner and that. Mm. Um, so it's about trying to find out what you're interested in and exploring different avenues so then you can go into a job that you want because I feel like I'd really struggle to go into a nine to five job having, because I've got s- quite a lot of freedom in my life right now like i've got um, i'm here on a wednesday i've got a day off i train seven till three and then i've got my evenings off get my weekend i don't get my weekends i play my games on the weekend (laughs) you get a lot of time off all right we get some time off yeah my missus doesn't like it because you can never book holidays yeah because you just never we we do never know when we're going to be off like i remember when we went to dubai last year it was three days before we went on holiday i was like Mm -hmm. dina i've got a week off she let's went, go <laughs> let's go and because she can work remotely from her laptop with her nutrition stuff she's like fine perfect let's go mm. which is good but i know some of the other boys who have got more hours like more strict hours in an office potentially their wife's then like right let's go i've got time off like can't yeah yeah <laughs> but yeah i don't know what i'm going to do after so if anyone so you, wants if anyone no wants ideas. to give me a job just hit me up <laughs> <laughs> do you think that it would be something in front of the camera i know that we've got cameras here today and um, i know that you, you were talking about netflix yeah Are you allowed to talk about that or yeah it... yeah so yeah. um netflix were doing uh behind the scenes of uh behind the scenes of the six nations mm-hmm. so we had a camera crew in with us the whole of the six nations mm-hmm. so you're kind of like drive to survive you ever watch drive to survive yeah the, yeah, 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 yeah. One? so it's kind of going to be like that where they follow different people through the journey of mm-hmm. the six nations like they do interviews with a lot of people. They're there filming in the team room at dinner, at training. Um, nice and awkward, was it? It was. So it was funny. We were being in the team room, yeah. um, like just having banter, chatting on the laptops, or whatever. And then all of a sudden you see the big mic come over. <laughs> and you look around and the camera's there and everyone just goes like this. Like... <laughs> the banter just ceases to exist. It's so hard to be yourself when yeah. they're like that. Yeah. Like, where's this now? It's like, we're just chatting, so it's fine. Yeah. But it's like, if I'm chatting to a mate casually about like going out for beers yeah. or you're bitching about someone, like just say, just say a coach hasn't pitched you're like, fuck's sake. <laughs> and then the camera's going, you're like, oh no, shouldn't have said that. <laughs> They're going to find They're out They're a great now. guy. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? So yeah, they came around to, to my house um, and me and my missus were doing some filming with them. They're like, right, pretend we're not here. And we got used to it, but I... It, the way I speak to my missus is like probably different to how we would have spoke yeah. to her when the cameras are there. Um but hopefully it turns out all good because I think it's it's what the sport needs is a bit more hype. 
it needs more hype because rugby yeah. is very it, it, rugby's beige compared to other sports in the world like you look at i love looking at like american sports like the nba nfl massive personalities mm -hmm like there's beef there's it's just a bit more fun yeah but they do have so much more interest in it like they've got hundreds of thousands of it's, people coming to games and I, I suppose it's partly because of that like beef side of things if you look at what drive to survive did to f1 and max verstappen yeah because he has that bullish characteristic yeah. people want to see what he does next yeah do you think that's is there anyone in the rugby game that's kind of bullish like that i don't think so like people are we're we're, we're just nice guys <laughs> and a normal think, bloke <laughs> yeah i think i think it, i think rugby needs to kind of be spiced up a little bit because mm. it's kind of two premiership rugby clubs have gone under because mm. they're not not getting enough money so that's like 120 players out of contract so it's like we need to somehow like revitalize it yeah get a little spark into it it's like i was thinking about it the other day it's like golf like they brought in live golf and then it's kind of like the rivalry there they're changing golf but louder is a slogan it's like changing it it's making it more fun it's making it more appealing to everyone mm -hmm. so i don't know how they could do it start a league in india yes <laughs> yeah we, we saw it well they're drew. starting a league in america and it's gone really well well drew was talking about how david beckham went to was it was it america yeah, yeah. He, yeah he went to the states and uh and he was promoting football in the states, and yeah. now, and now all of a sudden, the states of it's growing. The, yeah. the football within the states is growing. I think that a Netflix series would be great because because yeah. they have such a wide reach. Yeah. But I also think the social media, in terms of what Jim's doing with the podcast, mm -hmm. that's that's brilliant as well. Yeah. And I think the more players that can go into the using their following from rugby because yeah. there's rugby fans out there promoting rugby, yeah, is great for sure. Anything. I mean, today that's what we're kind of doing as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Do you think I've actually I've got another question so <laughs> I've actually got a lot. So do you think who is your favorite player but also your least favorite player out of the Scotland team? <laughs> Who's my favorite? <laughs> what do you mean favorite player like my best mate? Just your best pal. Was it is it is it Adam? Right, Haystow, it's Adam. Yeah, okay. I would say I've got loads of best mates but I'm probably closest with Hasto. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, who's and then my the, least, uh, least my least favorite yeah, person down remember there. that word though like least least <laughs> oh i don't know it's a hard one and it has been recorded <laughs> yeah don't know it's hard one. i like all my friends yeah. yeah i can't possibly comment on that okay good man <laughs> good man uh, i know that stuart hogg has just retired and i'm very upset about it <laughs> what are your thoughts to, to me he is he's been there for a minute and he is a yeah. total legend i also think He's still such a brilliant player, mm -hmm. even though he obviously is wanting to retire. He's still such an incredible player. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you people are like, oh, he's quite young to retire. But I think if you look at the career he's had, he started playing for Scotland when he was 18 and he's yeah. not stopped. So yeah. he's had 10, 12 years right at the top of rugby. And it does take a toll on your body. Um, so I think... I remember he said in his in his post that I think he put up when he was trying is like his body is not quite able to keep up with the way that he wants to be able to play rugby. Yeah. Because when he's on form, he's a he's a world class player. Yeah. But I think he's struggling just a little bit with his body in terms of being able to get to the level he wants to be at. And he's been at the top for so long. He's got a hundred caps for Scotland. Like yeah. that's a ridiculous feat. There's only ten internationals a year, and you've got a that he's played ten a year for 10 years or 11 years he's only been on the bench once it's, it's, I, yeah, it's, I, it's a remarkable feat like he's played yeah. a lot of rugby so i think he can be pretty happy with he's had a remarkable career with putting the boots up yeah uh, yeah and, and he's obviously in finsby as well yeah bless you. Oh, bless me. Thank you. <laughs> he's obviously in finsby as well so he's got that kind of security of now that i'm coming out of rugby I can go into the he'll business. have his finger and fingers in many pies i think i think he'll be absolutely yeah. fine <laughs> yeah yeah no he's a great guy i, I just think what's what still surprises me bless well, you me <laughs> <laughs> uh, what still surprises me about stuart hogg is that his turn of pace is mm. just mental you see him, seeing him play is like seeing art it's like see when he grabs the ball and he, all of a sudden he's like so fast off yeah. the, he's just off the mark he's rapid yeah Are you is that because he's got short legs though <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. He's gonna, he's gonna come for you for that one. Is uh, are you faster than Sherhog? Oh no, like maybe now top mm. end, like because I've got such long legs. If I yeah. get up into my stride, maybe <laughs> long legs. His acceleration though, yeah, is it's like Darcy's agile. Darcy had an injury, didn't he? Duan's like down straight. Yeah. Don't uh, want to get in his way. 
No way. No <laughs> See way. if Duhan ran at you. Would you were all right to tackle him? Yeah, I'd try my best. We're, we're, <laughs> we're pals, so, you know, you just go easy and I'll go easy, of course. Yeah, yeah. And Darcy had an injury in his leg? Yeah, he did his knee uh, when he was playing for Edinburgh. He had a great season last year. Mm. Um, he played unbelievably well for Edinburgh and Scotland and then unfortunately got his injury. And then when he came back, he only had three games, I think, for Edinburgh. And then he got, he was, uh, so he missed a huge chunk of the season and then he was still nominated for a player of the season because that's how well he's been playing. Yeah. He's a tough little fucker. Yeah. Like, he's, he's so, but the, the thing that Drew and I interviewed him and he is the nicest oh, guy. So nice. He is the most lovely guy you'll yeah. ever meet. But when he's on the pitch, he's scary. He's got that border in him. He's yeah. A he's a border's Hoik. boy. Yeah, he's a Hoik <laughs> lad. They're built different down there. He's a small lad, but he puts his, he throws his body, he puts his body in the line week in, week yeah. out. And he's consistently been one of our best players for the last few years, which is great to see because I remember playing with Dars back when it was like under 17s under 18s and you could see his raw talent because he was so fast mm -hmm. and he's now developed his game to where he's one of the best wingers in the world yeah. under the high ball his running ability his tackling ability like it's, it's just great to see his development it's his agility more than anything i remember seeing a try that he scored where he was basically pushed out but his body was up over yeah. the line so he didn't actually go out because his foot wasn't down yeah. over the line so he wasn't offside and he managed to put the ball down he's a freak it, it's it, mental the flexibility agility on that person is wild finn russell mm. He is the epitome of someone that you, he's not built like a rugby player. No. He's not, but he's so talented. Uh, Talk to me about him. He isn't built like a rugby player, but the thing is he's so fit and he's and he's rugby strong. Like a lot of people can uh, I'm sure Jamie Richard won't mind me saying, like he's not Jamie is not strong in the gym upper body wise. Mm. But then in a game, he won't miss tackles and he'll dominate people. It's so, more of technique. It's technique and it's also he's got he's got that dog in him. Yeah, he's got that dog in him. <laughs> <laughs> so like Finn Finn is is a he's he's obviously hugely talented and he's but he's very fit. Like a lot of people won't think that, but he can charge about the place. Uh but yeah, he's he works really hard in his game. Like people a lot of people don't see it, which I think the Netflix thing will be really good to see is kind of like who he is as a character. Because a lot of people just see the like kind of loose side of him maybe mm -hmm. like i don't care blah blah blah. but it's, it's not true like he cares a lot he puts a lot of work into his craft and he mm -hmm. does a lot of behind the scenes things that nobody sees like watching footage he probably watches the most footage in the team um so he's mentally right up there with one of the most switched on players and obviously he's ridiculously talented so yeah. you can pull off some things that other people can crazy things yeah. I, I i actually did a video recently i've not released it but i said that i think talent perceived talent is hundreds of hours of work seen for the first time yeah so i think that if people are watching these games they've not seen all this background work that you guys yeah, do exactly you're in training camps for months yeah and, and and i think that people are saying well you know darcy's talented or finn's talented or you're talented mm -hmm. i think that you guys work really freaking hard yeah for what you get and i think that maybe that's the bit that this netflix series will really unveil to people yeah. And it might be, it will, it will be a really positive thing. Yeah, I think so. I think like supporters see us for the 80 minutes that we're on the pitch, whereas they don't see us for the the three months of pre-season or like the 10 years that we've been playing rugby and all the training we've done. So obviously some people are more talented than other people when it comes to certain things like... Like running I'm, or... Yeah. I'm going to be better at running and passing than a prop is, but a prop yeah. is going to be better at scrummaging and lifting weights than me. So everyone's got their different skills and attributes. Yeah. And that's why the team comes out because you can you can fill out those, you know, I'm not as good at this, but I'm great yeah, at this. Give them all shapes and sizes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> are you working on anything in the background in terms of you, you, sort, of, you sort of mentioned you're, you're not sure where you want to go after rugby yeah is there anything that you've got in your mind that you're kind of working on in the background that you think might be a possibility or quick one guys if you enjoy these podcasts on the into the mind channel if you could please hit that subscribe button that like button that five star button wh whatever it is wherever you are it would be much appreciated we're trying to get to our goal of ten thousand subscribers or followers and if you could help us reach that goal we would really appreciate it thank you uh no, no not really to be honest it's something like like we were saying earlier something that i've been thinking about more mm. um pardon me uh is trying to find something that i'm going to be interested in post rugby and i've not quite figured out what it is yet um i can't remember if i said it earlier but it was like my missus was saying sometimes you just got to dive into something mm. see if you like it if you don't try something else and kind of tick things off maybe because 
if you just sit around being like, oh, maybe I'll like that, maybe I won't, I'll just leave it. And maybe like try it out and then yeah. see if I do like it, but I've got no idea. She says I'd be funny if I just recorded myself and had a YouTube channel. I, you know, I'd agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'd agree. I'll just set up GoPros around my yeah. house. You know what? I've you just recording things. It's like the, the 360, put, someone puts it in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> I just walk around like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be quite interesting if you had a YouTube channel, like film the ins and outs of like. God, oh, no, that would still be when I played rugby. So that wouldn't be my job after rugby. Oh, well, you could coach. You could go no, into coaching. No, I don't think or... I could do coaching. I don't think I could. I've done a few things like player appearances, coaching wise, and they, I just get too frustrated. At the players. Well, it depends what age they are. So it's like I was at the age where you think you know everything and you don't listen to adults. So it's like when you get kids that age, like, right, guys, let's do this, this, and this. And they're like, no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> then you get young kids who just want to charge about the place and they listen yeah. to you. And then you get the older kids who are maybe 17, 18 and they're really interested about learning mm. from like a professional versus that age, like 12 to 15, where they just, they're like, we will do what we want. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and do you, so, so that your kind of plans for the future, you're not really sure where you're going at the moment. Yeah. I, I heard an interesting stat. If you spend 100 hours on something, which is 18 minutes a day, so whether that's, karate rugby mm. weightlifting video editing whatever it is a language a language you'll be better than 95 percent of the population on that thing yeah wow what are you thinking of dabbling and it's only in? what 18 minutes a day 18 minutes a day consistency is key it is consistency is key you're right consistency is key it's like the diet if you have yeah. a consistently bad diet the odds are you'll, you'll probably gain weight if you have a consistently good diet the odds are you'll probably have a six pack if you're consistent, it turns into part of your routine and you don't have to think about it. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do loads of different 18 minute yeah. walks throughout my day. On my your days day. off, just have hours of 18 minute walks. <laughs> Become beast at everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I never thought, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to learn different languages, obviously. Um, not obviously. Your girlfriend's Nor Norwegian? She's Norwegian, yeah. So, so she speaks? She speaks English and Norwegian. Uh, oh, so it is Norwegian. I'm so bad yeah. asking things. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so she speaks Norwegian, but her English is really good. Like she's been over in Edinburgh for seven years now, I want to say, maybe a bit more. Um, and her English is really good, but I I know a little bit of Norwegian, like that she's taught me that I can kind of communicate to her friends and family, like having a bit of banter. Because mm. um, I went over to Norway for the first time last year, I think, and met all her friends. I, her dad's been over a few times. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was so embarrassing. So her dad came over. The first time I met her dad, I was like, right, I know this saying. I was like, I can say, hi, Jan, Eric, how are you? I can say that in Norwegian. Uh -huh. And then I sent it to him and he's like, what? And I was like, <laughs> and then I tried one more time. I was like, what am I going on? He's like, what? And I was like, ah, you all right? <laughs> and I just went on and I was like, oh God, no. It was so embarrassing. But at least I tried. Um, but it's funny when you sit around the dinner table with with those two together because they're obviously more com he's obviously more comfortable speaking mm. norwegian to dina but he speaks very good english and if we're at the dinner table just chatting and then he starts speaking norwegian to her i'm like oh no they could they're, be they could be saying they're anything. bitching about me <laughs> they're bitching about me behind my back <laughs> have you did, did you so whereabouts did you go in norway was it Lef it wasn't lofoten you said it was uh so she her dad lives in a place called Fre frederiksta mm. which is about an hour and a half south of oslo so it's near the border with Sweden. It's a beautiful little village. Um, he lives just outside of the main uh, town, Frederikstad, and he's this beautiful little village right on the water, very picturesque. He's got a boat. It's a lovely house, big garden. Oh, it's, uh, we went to... It's a different way of living there. It, it literally is, yeah. and it's such a rich country. We went to Lofoten. I've been a couple of times as a photographer. That's like where you want to go. Yeah. I've never experienced anywhere so vast mm. and picturesque and beautiful. beautiful. It is absolutely stunning. You have these huge mountain ranges, but you still have the infrastructure of like a like a like a city yeah. out in the wilderness. It's weird. Like the the tunnels, they have tunnels that go under the sea for like four or five miles. Yeah, that's mad. Eh? So how did they actually build that? <laughs> how did somebody actually like figure? And it smells like fish because you're going under the sea. Like, <laughs> how did somebody figure this out? If you what what's the best advice you ever received within your rugby career? Oh, that is a very good question. Because I know you sh you shadowed Hoggy for a bit, didn't you? Uh, or you like learned from him? Yeah, you learned from everyone, I suppose. But yeah, he was the one. He was the number one in, in the position that I was in. Um, the best advice in rugby, God. I actually, I actually don't know. I genuinely don't know. 
But I, something will always stick with me was before my first cap for Scotland, I was on the bench, shit in my pants. We're playing England. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm terrified. Here we go. <laughs> I, was, I just turned 21, I think. Um, and Greg Laidlaw just said to me before the game, he was like, just go out there and do what you were picked for. Like, do your thing, do what you're good at. And it's kind of always kind of brought me back down to earth and kind of relaxed me a little bit. But yeah, I don't know, just be yourself. It's hard. I actually genuinely do. That's a great question. We have to think about that. Um, I've had a lot of like good mentors in my rugby career, a lot of great coaches that have helped me. Um, I th- I think one of the it's funny that you remember certain things. I remember being about fifteen at school, and my coach just telling me, just saying, just run with the ball, and I was like, all right. And then that's where my rugby journey kind of kicked off, yeah. and I started getting picked for like the age grade stuff. And I was like, it's funny, like I still remember it to this day. Just run. Mm-hmm. Mr. Allingham, my PE teacher, just run with the ball. <laughs> and it's yeah. funny how those things stick with you. Yeah, yeah. And who do you think, so, so you said that Adam was your best, probably your best pal in the rugby team. Hey, Stowe. Hey, Stowe. <laughs> you got any horror stories about him that you can share? Ooh, <laughs> none, that, none that are appropriate for camera. <laughs> <laughs> What's he like in the back room when he's, when he's prepping? Uh, like before a game, uh, well, we usually room together. So before a game, it can be quite funny. We're like, we'll just be chilling and be like, oh, we've got a game. And you're like, ooh, <laughs> you get real nervous. Um, but like, we just sit in, the, sit in the team room together, like chill out, have banter, have a bit of crack. He's hilarious. He's very relaxed, very down to earth, very chilled. Um, and we bounce well off each other. Like we've known each other for many years, been on like quite a few holidays together. Mm. Um we'll always FaceTime each other or we always voice message each other. It's the best way of communication, I reckon. <laughs> if it's not FaceTime, it's a voice message. Yeah. Um, and it's, I don't see him quite as much now because he moved from Glasgow to Gloucester. Mm. Uh, but he's loving it down there and it's nice that he's kind of, he had a bit of a rough luck with injury. Um, yeah, I saw that. So Sh- shoulder? Yeah, shoulder. Yeah. He did his knee and then his shoulder. So it's good that he's kind of back into form and it's good to have yeah. him up for the World Cup stuff. We were talking to, I interviewed john barkley who's the ex-scotland captain i think i think it was like it must be like a year or two ago now but he was talking to me about all his injuries and he was saying that when he tries to lift himself out of a pool mm. so like so you know how you need to put your hands in the yeah. and you sort of push yourself off he said he can't, he can't do that because he can't pe- ba- bend his wrist, pa- yeah, side, bad side, wrist. <laughs> and uh, he said he's got pins in his shoulder yeah. he's got a dodgy ankle yeah he's he did bro- his achilles tendon yeah. he, he's broken all his feet he's broken his no it's just mental the injuries that you guys go through and you're just like you're still probably fitter than us even though you go through all these injuries <laughs> we will look terrible in about 30 years when the back goes and the knees go that's for sure yeah, Hold yeah. On about the place. <laughs> and what advice finally what advice would you give someone that's just starting out in rugby a, a young teenager that's just starting out uh have fun i know it's so cliche to say but have fun enjoy it don't take it too seriously because that's when when you enjoy something, that's when you get the biggest, uh, I don't know. Rush. Yeah, it's, you get the biggest rush, but it's, you get the biggest, like, what's the best way to say it? You get the most back from it. So like, Gratification. Yeah, it's like if I enjoy playing rugby and I'm having fun with my mates, I, I play well, the results come, we win. And it's a nice cycle, whereas if you're not enjoying it, you're not, you won't play well. You're not relaxed. So yeah, have fun with it. Enjoy it. Don't take it too seriously. Just fly about the place. <laughs> Run about. Do you, Run would about, you think, have crack? Would you do rugby even if you weren't being paid? Do you enjoy it that much? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it's Just funny the physical tool. It's like it's like what you said. It's like when I was at school, um, I never really thought about being a professional rugby player. I just loved it. Mm um and then when i got to about eight when i was in my last year of school i was going to go to university of loughborough to do psychology because i was like right i want to go to a good rugby uni mm. um i'll do i'll do my degree i'll play rugby on the side i never really thought that i could go professional and then i got a call saying like oh we're interested in signing you mm. and then that's when i was like oh i'll i'm not going to go. uni i'll go and do professional rugby and the first couple of years, I was very naive to what professional rugby was because I'd just come from school where you just rock up and play. Yeah. You don't do anything on the on the no side. Prep. <laughs> you don't do any prep. You turn up for a game of the weekend and our team was better than any other team. So you win mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, this is easy. And then I got a real shock in professional <laughs> rugby for maybe about the first year and a half. Like I didn't really lift weights. I was skinny, didn't do any prep, like looking on computers and stuff like that now. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I was and I was terrible. Well, I wasn't maybe terrible, but I wasn't as good as I could have been. And it was only maybe when Richard Cockrell came into Edinburgh 2017 that I was like, oh, this is what it takes to be a professional rugby player. You got to work hard. You got to eat well. You got to gym. You got to do all your prep and recovery off the pitch. And that's when my career kind of took, took off. off. So obviously, when you're playing the game, you have there's a couple of different factors at play. So you have your rest and recovery when you're out of the game. You obviously have the the gym side of things, physical fitness. Yeah. You have the analysis kind of thing. So when you analyze a game, when you're rewatching a game, what are you looking for? Yeah. So that it, it actually happens. Or my missus can get annoyed sometimes because you finish a game and you're straight on your computer watching it. <laughs> and then on Monday, or before going in on a Monday, you're watching it thinking, right, what could I have done better? Mm-hmm. And then after you've done that, you're like, right, what could, in my position as being a 10, uh, sometimes it's like, right, what could we have done to put ourselves in better positions? Was this the right decision to kick it here? Was mm-hmm. it the right decision to run it here? Is everyone in the right position? And then you clip them up, you send them into your coach, you then go through them on a, on a Monday. You're like, right, we didn't do this very well. So this week at training, we're going to try this, this, and this. And then hopefully it'll work at the weekend. So it, it can be quite a long process. Like you're reviewing your own game. You're reviewing the team's game. You're then feeding back to the coaches. Mm-hmm. And then you got a team meeting where you feed it all back to the team. So I could have the, I could watch the same clips maybe like in one morning, five or six times, just because I've got, I watch them myself. I then watch them with the other decision makers in the team I then watch them with the coaches I'll then watch them just with the backs and then I'll watch them with the team and I've got to be discussing it's like coaches have uh, become more player led because they don't want one voice coming across all the time so if your head coach is just speaking to you the whole time it can get a bit boring repetitive so they want different voices so like the 10 will be speaking other decision makers will be speaking so you've got to know your stuff inside out so when you're standing up in front of 40, 50 people in a team meeting, mm-hmm. you can speak it confidently. Because mm-hmm. if you, I would say, if you say stuff with confidence, people will believe you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, that's like half of it. It's like, right. When the coach throws out a question, it's like, right, what should we have done here? And everyone's a bit like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. It's like, no, we're going to do this and this because then that'll work. And everyone's like, okay, we'll do that. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it can. it is a lot of behind the scenes work going in. And do you have any moves that you've used specifically that have worked? Well, you might not be able to talk about some yeah. of them, but have worked on a certain team. So, for example, do you utilize certain people in certain positions like Duhan or yeah. what, what, what's the... Yeah. Talk me through a move. Yeah, definitely. So, like going into a week, you'll see... So, just say we're playing England, you see how they defend off line outs, for instance. Mm. And you're like, right, oh, they, after we hit up in the middle, they tend to overfold so we could come back to the short side straight away using Duhan maybe. Foreign language to me. Foreign yeah. language, yeah, I know. But it's like, okay, so they tend to overfold in a certain scenario. So yeah. what we'll do is we'll try and create that scenario from a line out. So it's like, right, we'll hit up a big ball carry in the middle and then we'll bring someone around. And then no, we'll get them on the third phase on the way back. I know it sounds confusing, but yeah, you do. It goes into that sort of detail where everyone knows where they're meant to be for five, six phases. And when was it? I know we spoke just earlier. When was it the Duhan came into the game? So with Scotland, I'm actually struggling to remember. It was, I think it was, it was the end of COVID. I remember he got his first cap when we played Georgia at Murrayfield. There was no crowds, and I want to say it was the end of 2020 or the start of 2021. I can't really remember. It's all a blur. Those those years. those three years, yeah, complete blur. Because he his career skyrocketed, didn't it? Yeah. So he joined Edinburgh, I think, in 2017. So I've known him for years. And he came over as like, he got hip surgery as soon as he arrived at Edinburgh. Mm. He always had massive biceps. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he got even bigger biceps when he was injured. Um, but he was really fast. He was really powerful. He was really strong. He was a very raw rugby player. And now to see his kind of growth in the game, his rise in the game to then being great for Edinburgh and then develop his game even further and becoming great for Scotland to then starting three tests for the British Lions, like... Mm. His growth has been ridiculous. Um, and he's developed small parts of his games. Like people always used to kick high balls onto him. It's like he's a great runner, but he's not got no skills. He'll drop high balls. Mm. And then he worked on that part of his game and now no one kicks to him because he's so dangerous. Because if he gets it, he's running through exactly. you. I've seen, I've seen clips of him where he's sprinting down the line and you've got four people trying to tackle him and they physically just can't, they can't get hold of him. Yeah, he's a freak. He's, 
He's a pretty, and he's a lovely guy as well, which makes even better. A handsome, handsome man. Handsome, good looking, lovely. Oh. That is really <laughs> oh, that was an odd noise to make about it, Dan. <laughs> he's a handsome guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the I on, on a final note, the the perception about rugby players, in my eyes, from the general public, especially from Glasgow, Scotland, Edinburgh. Is that oh they're they're absolutely mental and they go out every night and they're not very nice job blah blah blah. From my experience, every single person that I've spoken to has been the most lovely guy. <laughs> that I've yeah. So I just want to thank you so much for 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 coming on no, and actually taking the time to do it. No, absolutely, it's been great fun. It's a it's an odd perception though, isn't it? It's weird. I think sometimes it's because people see if we are go out in a social maybe and there's like forty of us in fancy dress, it can look a bit like what was it your, can your... look a bit boisterous and a bit loose maybe. But like everyone's really nice and friendly. Yeah, and you're working so hard. I think it's more that like because you you work so hard in training camps that when you go out, you go out. Right? Yeah, it can get loose. And and I've done the same thing when I was in the <laughs> when I was doing the shoot for with Canon. When I got back. My pals were like, well, let's celebrate. And we went out. Like, we went yes. hard. <laughs> but, but I think you guys just have the eyes on you a little bit more. Yeah, it's probably a bit that. And if you're all wearing fancy dress looking yeah. like idiots, it kind of brings a bit more attention to you as well. Exactly. <laughs> right, well, listen, thank you so much. Really no, thank that. you. It's been a pleasure to come on here. And that brings us to the end of the Into the Mind podcast. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast and took a little nugget of information from somewhere. If you enjoyed, please consider hitting that subscribe button or that follow button from wherever you are. I'd really, really appreciate it. And before we go, we need to we need to talk about our sponsors. Chisholm Hunter are the sponsors of this podcast, and I honestly need to thank them for making all of this possible. They're a luxury diamond and watch retailer located in the UK with 29 stores throughout. They're family run and they've been going for over 165 years, which is pretty impressive. So Chisholm Hunter. Thank you.